to open your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 1. This morning, and we're looking at the second in a series of lessons on the Gospel of Mark, which is, of course, the Gospel of Action. Next week, we'll, we'll take a break and, and uh, think specifically about Mother's Day and have a, a Mother's Day message. But then following that, we'll come back to Mark. Uh, last week, last Sunday morning, when I reminded you that, that God has given us four pictures of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew and, and Luke are more like color slides uh, of the life of Jesus, wonderful details about the life of Jesus. Uh, John is, is more like uh, a magnificent portrait of the life of, of Christ with all of its richness and beauty. But Mark is an action-packed movie and uh, a, a, just a blockbuster film in, in words like immediately and forthwith and straightway. These are the words, the action words here in, in the Gospel of Mark. And, and I want us to begin Reading in verse 14 here in Mark chapter 1. It says, Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. As he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately after they left their nets and followed him, going on a little far farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them. They left their father Zebedee in, in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your message. We thank you for your word. We thank you especially... Uh, for this story about the calling of the disciples. And, and Lord, uh, help us to see that it's not only something that happened in that ancient time, Lord, but it's something that's current for us today. Lord, you're calling us as well uh, to follow you and to fish for, for men and for women who need uh, to be rescued from the deep. Lord, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I just mentioned in my prayer, this, this is the story of Jesus calling his first disciples. And uh, his first disciples, we discover right away, were fishermen. And, and let me just say that all of, of the disciples today should be fishermen. Uh, I want to talk to you today on, on this subject. How you can be a fisher of men. Now, this is men in that generic form. It means men and women. So, how you can be a fisher of men. I, I don't know of anything more thrilling or more exciting than to know that God can use me, can use you uh, to be a fisher of men. And, and there's no greater fulfillment on this earth than to bring somebody else to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and so, how can we be fishers of men? Uh, because soul winning is fishing for men. When, when, when we fish for fish, you think about it, when, when you fish for fish, you're, you're taking out of a beautiful life, this fish out of a beautiful life, into death, right? You're going to eat it probably. But when we fish for men, we take men and women out of, out of death into a beautiful life with the Lord Jesus Christ. So that seems to be an even better way of fishing, doesn't it? And Jesus was the one here who said, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. What an exciting and thrilling prospect that Jesus can use us for this task. The Bible says that just before he called these men to be fishers of men, he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Do you remember what the word gospel means? I told you last week, it means good news. And... Uh, uh, what is, what is good news for? You know, what, what do you do with good news? You keep it to yourself? You share it, don't you? You share good news. You tell it. That's, that's what you ought to do with good news. 
Dr. Landrum Level was seminary president at uh, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary down there in, in, the, in the, the south, kind of more the east. I was in, uh, went to uh, uh, Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth. But th uh, this man was the president of the seminary there in New Orleans for many, many years. It, he said that when he was a pastor at the close of World War II, he had the responsibility and, and the privilege to take a particular message to a boy's mother. And, and here's the story. Uh, there had been a, a, a young man that had been reported missing in action, and later he was declared to be dead. Uh, the church, the town, the family, the mother all wept because that young man had been killed in war. Uh, they, they'd not even found his body. And, and then later on, they actually discovered that the young man wasn't dead at all. He was alive. And the State Department came to this pastor and he said, Pastor, we believe that you're the one who should go and tell that mother that her son is alive. So can you imagine that being given that privilege and that responsibility? And, and think about this situ situation for just a minute. Can you imagine just absolutely knowing that, that your child is dead? Your son has been killed in battle. You know, they told you he's dead. And then all of a sudden you hear this message that your son isn't dead. He's alive and, and he's going to be coming home in a few days. So, so what do you think happened here? Uh, when, when they came to this pastor, they said, would you please go and tell this mother? What do you think that pastor did? You think he said, well, you know, if I can get around to it, maybe in a month or two, you know, I might go if it's convenient. You think that's what he said? Of course not. With, with a heart that's just beating with joy and anticipation, he went right away and told that mother this good news that her son was alive. Of course he told her as soon as he could. Don't you think that, that we ought to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in the same way? Because it's good news. It's exciting news. Uh, and that's what the gospel is. And, and who is it that gets to tell the good news? You know, we get to tell. We have that privilege and that joy. Uh, there, there are three thoughts I want to get into your heart and into your mind today. And, and I believe that if you'll get these three thoughts into your heart and in your mind, then God will use you to be a fisher of men. Uh, God will make you an effective soul winner. Number one, I want you to see the people that he called and then believe that God can use you too. Look again in verses 16 and 17. It says, and As he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Uh, whom did Jesus choose to be his disciples? Did he choose bank presidents and lawyers and doctors and university professors? Not really. First he chose fishermen. Ordinary, common fishermen. They were Galileans, it says. They, they, the Galileans themselves were known as being kind of crude. We might say backwoodsy people, you know. Just common people. Kind of rough and uneducated and, and common. In other words, Jesus didn't commit his cause to an ad agency or to a university. He gave it to just normal people, just common, average people. What does that tell us today? That, that, that tells us that God's plan is to take ordinary people. Are you listening here? God's plan is to take ordinary people and do extraordinary things through them. You know, you, you don't need to say, well, I'm, you know, I'm nobody. Because if, if that's what you say, then God said, okay, uh, you're, you're who I'm looking for. I want you. Uh, just put your finger in your margin there in, in Mark uh, by verse 16. And then uh, look over in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and, and listen to, to this. It says, for consider your calling, brethren. That there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen what? The foolish things of the world. 
to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things. Did you get that? The weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. You know what the word foolish means? It's the word that we get our word moron from. The Greek word that's used here is the word that we get the English word moron from. It means essentially the non-intellectual. So, so you didn't make grade, you know, high grades in, in school. That doesn't matter. God's looking for you. He, he can still use you. He has chosen, it says, the weak things. The word weak essentially means sickly, anemic, without strength. Uh, perhaps today you don't have bulging muscles, muscles, you know. You don't have bulging biceps and mountains of muscles. And vibrant health, God still wants to use you. That doesn't matter. Because God has chosen, it says, the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. Then verses 28 and 29 in 1 Corinthians 1. And the base things of the world and the despised things God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he might nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. The, the word base means low down, ignoble, without pedigree. Uh, as we would say, folks from the wrong side of, of the tracks. Okay? Uh, and the things which are despised. In other words, things which people look down on. Things which are not. Uh, people that, that are ignored. The, the, you know, these are the ones God wants to use. This is God's mighty army that He has chosen. The Bible goes on uh, so that no man may boast before God, verse 29, but by His doing you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Let, let me just say this to you this morning. Don't insult God by saying that He can't use you. God's plan is to take ordinary people and do extraordinary things through them and then get the glory for Himself. He chose fishermen. Is there anybody more unlikely to have been used mightily of God than Simon Peter, this big old, uh, rough, uncouth fisherman? You know, this man given to foul language and cursing, always talking when he ought to be listening, about the only time he opened his mouth was to change feet. You know, God took rough old Simon Peter and he used him. And, and Andrew, you know, talk about an introvert. Sometimes we're very unkind to introverts, but actually they do some mighty amazing things. You never hear much about Andrew except that he's uh, Simon Peter's brother, sitting probably there in the corner, probably used to just listening to his, his brother Simon around his mouth. And, and God took these two very unlikely people. He didn't, he didn't choose them for what they were. He chose them for what He could make out of them. Uh, listen again to the language. It's, Jesus said, follow me and I will make you become. You know? He's the maker of men and women. Amen? I will make you to become. He, he didn't choose them for what they were or who they were. He, cho he chose them because He could make out of them fishermen. Fishers of men. I will make you to become. So if you're doubting in this area that the thing is that, that you don't understand what God can do with you if you'll just surrender your life to Him. You, you don't understand the ability that God has to make something more out of you than you, you can even imagine you might become. And, and so let's not insult God uh, and, and understand that God can use you. Uh, it's not humility you know, to, to say, oh, I'm, I'm nobody, God can't use me. You know, don't call that humility. Uh, um, you know, trust that God can use you. A man named Russell Conwell was the pastor of Temple Baptist Church in Philadelphia back at the turn of the century, and, and he was a very gifted man, a, a man that had compassion on other people. Uh, uh, they, they were saying to Russell Conwell that there were young men, young preachers, uh, who needed to be educated, but they didn't have the money, and and, and uh, we need a university, they were telling me, to educate these young men. And so Russell Conwell had the idea that he would found, and he did found, Temple University. 
And uh, he raised, uh, let me tell you how he, how he founded Temple University. He, he did it by raising money, uh, by giving one speech. He gave this one speech, this one sermon, 6,000 times. And the title of that sermon was Acres of Diamonds. He raised $7 million by giving that one message. And that's back when $7 million was actually worth $7 million. And in that message, he told the story, a true story, about an African who heard about the, the diamond mines that were discovered in Africa and how people had been making millions of dollars by discovering diamonds. And so this man, who longed to be rich, just like many people, and, and so he sold his farm and he set off to discover diamonds. He traveled all over Africa looking for diamonds, but he never found these diamonds that he was looking for. And finally, at the end of his life, he was very dejected. Uh, failure was, was the, the only way to describe his life. Despair. He threw himself into a river and drowned himself. And so he died by suicide. But that's actually not the end of the story. You see, the man who bought the farm that he had sold, one day was walking across the farm, and he passed the stream that went, ran through the, the farm, and he noticed kind of an unusual looking rock in the stream. And he reached down and he picked up this rock. And that rock was a magnificent diamond. And he began to discover that the entire farm that he had bought from that man was just studded with diamonds. He became one of the richest diamond uh, miners. The, you know, it was the richest diamond mine in all of Africa. And this man who sold the farm was standing in the middle of acres of diamonds, but he didn't know it. And he sold his diamonds to go off and look for diamonds when he was just standing in the middle of acres of diamonds. And so let me tell you something about that this morning. That's how God made you. God uniquely crafted you. He uniquely gifted you. And God has given you spiritual gifts and abilities that He Himself wants to develop. You might say, oh, if I could only sing like that, that person, or, or if, if you know, I could only talk like this person, or, or if I had that gift, or if I just had this ability. Uh, I'm telling you that God has placed you in the middle of acres of diamonds, diamonds of abilities that He's already given you, if you'll only see it and only trust Him and only begin to develop what He's already given you. God chose ordinary people and He did extraordinary things through them. They weren't anything special. What was special was the, the God that they served and the God that they trusted. Peter and John and James and Andrew were used mightily of God and, and, and so much that they were used to turn that known world upside down. Literally, the world was turned upside down by these these disciples that Jesus called them. And they came against the great intellectual giants of that day. And the Bible says they couldn't understand, you know, how, how they were, how these men were, were as intelligent as they were, as learned as they were. And, 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 and they came against them. And, and the Bible says in Acts 4 that when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they marveled and took knowledge of them and, 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 and that they had been with Jesus. Acts 4.13 now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Jesus made something out of them. He had kept His word. Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. So, what do you think right now? Can God use you? You know, Can God take you and, and mold you and make you a fisher of men? Uh, again, let's not insult God by saying He can't, because He can. He's, you're exactly the person He's looking for if, if you consider yourself, you know, nobody special. He, 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 look at these people that He chose and, and see the people He chose and, and believe that if God can use Peter and Andrew, then God can use anyone. He can use even you to do His work. And, and that's the first thing this morning. If you would become a fisher of men. But not only do we see the people that he chose. And we, we, we also see the, the purpose that he has ordained. Uh, 
He says, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. What, what was the purpose of the Lord Jesus when he was here on earth? Why did he leave the glories and the splendors of heaven? Why did he come and live among us and walk the dusty shores of Galilee? And why did he preach and teach and heal and, and suffer and die? Why did he bathe this world with his blood? Jesus tells us here in Luke 19, verse 10, just one little sentence. He says to us, For the Son has man, for the Son of Man has come. Why? To seek and to save the lost, that which was lost. That's why he's, he came. His heart is a missionary heart. His heart is, is, is a soul winner's heart. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. See if my logic is correct. Okay, that was his purpose. If you're a follower of his, then his purpose will become your purpose. Does that make sense? That was his purpose. And so if you're a follower of his, then that will also be your purpose. Jesus said some tough things. I'm about to say something that might be kind of tough. A man who says that he's a follower of Jesus Christ and is not a fisher of men is a liar. A woman who says that she's a follower of Jesus Christ and is not a fisher of men is a liar. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you to become fishers of men. And I'm saying that you see the people that he chose and then you see the purpose that he ordained. You follow me, I'll make you to become fishers of men. And if we're not fishing, it's because we're not following. Amen? John Wesley said, you have only one business on earth, that is to save souls. I want to read a, a portion of a modern day parallel. It's, it's a little long, but I'll, I'll cut it down just a little bit. So here goes. It goes like this. Now, it came to pass that a group existed that called themselves fishermen. And lo, there were many fish in the waters all around. In fact, the whole area was surrounded by streams and lakes filled with fish. And the fish were hungry week after week, month after month, year after year. Those who called themselves fishers met in the meetings and talked about their call to fish, the abundance of fish, and how they might go about fishing. Year after year, they carefully defined what fishing means, defended fishing as an occupation, and declared that fishing is always to be the primary task of fishermen. Continually, they searched for new and better methods of fishing, for new and better definitions of fishing. First they said, the fishing industry exists by fishing as a fire exists by burning. They loved slogans such as, fishing is the task of every fisherman. Every fisherman a fisher. And a fisherman's outpost for every fisherman's club. They sponsored special meetings called Fisherman's Campaign and the month of, for fishermen to fish. They sponsored costly nationwide and worldwide conferences to discuss fishing and promote fishing and to hear about the ways of fishing, such as the new fishing equipment, fish calls, and whether any new bait was available. These fishermen built large, beautiful buildings called fishing headquarters. The plea was that everyone should be a fisherman and every fisherman should fish. The one thing they did not do, however, they didn't fish. In addition to meeting regularly, they organized a board to send other fishermen to other places where there were many fish, and all of the fishermen seemed to agree that what was needed was a board which would challenge fishermen to be faithful in fishing. The, the board was formed by those who had the great vision and those who had great courage to speak about fishing, to define fishing, and to promote the idea of fishing in faraway streams and lakes where other fish of different colors lived. Also, the board hired staffs and appointed committees and held many meetings to define fishing, defend fishing, and to 
decide what new streams should be thought about. But the staff and committee, meeting, mem uh, committee members, they didn't fish. Large, elaborate, and extensive training centers originated and, and their primary purpose was teaching how to fish. Over the years, courses were offered to fishermen teaching the nature of fish, where to find fish, the psychological reactions of fish, and how to approach and feed fish. Those who taught fishing had doctorates in fishology, but the teachers did not fish. They only taught fishing. Year after year, after tedious training, many were graduated and given fishing licenses. They were sent to do full-time fishing, some to distant waters, which were filled with fish. Some spent much time studying and traveling to learn the history of fishing and to see faraway places where the fathers of great fishing in centuries past lived. They lauded the faithful fishermen of years before who handed down the idea of fishing. Well, I'll jump now to the end of this parable. Imagine how hurt some were when one day a person suggested that those who don't catch fish were not really fishermen, no matter how much they claimed to be. I used to like to talk to the people in Portugal. Portugal is considered to be 95% Catholic. I have a lot of Catholic friends, and some of them are in Portugal. And uh, so I never intend to uh, uh, be disrespectful of their faith. You know, it's, it's, it's their faith, and they have a uh, right to it. We have disagreements, though, on many doctrinal issues with that church. But when in Portugal, uh, I discovered from very, very sources, some of them were were politicians, some of them were, were Catholic priests and others. They, it was told that uh, there was 25% of the people that actually attended services in, in Portugal, but those politicians and others said there's, there's nowhere near that many people actually go to the Catholic Church and participate in worship there. So it's virtually an unchurched nation. Uh, but what I would, would do often in, when, when uh, I would talk with people and I would ask them, about their faith, and of course, if you're Portugal, you, you say you're, you're Catholic. And so I, I would ask them, you know, well, do you actually go to church? No, not really. I said, well, suppose I told you I, I play soccer, football. I'm a football player. But I don't have a, a uniform. I don't play on any team. I don't practice. But I tell you, I'm, you know, I play football. What do you think? Am I a football player? I don't practice. I don't play any games. I'm not on any team. Am I a football No, you're not a football player. Okay? Well, you tell me you're a Catholic, but you don't go to church. You don't go to confession. Uh, not even on Easter or Christmas do you go to church. You tell me you're a Catholic. How, how can you be a Catholic? You don't do anything to me to prove that you're a Catholic. Are you really a Catholic? And, You'd see the light bulb on, on top of their head turn on. I'm like, well, maybe I'm not. I don't actually participate in that belief. You know? We say we're followers of Jesus Christ, but do we fish for men? If we don't do the activity, maybe we need to re-examine it. You know? Is a person following if he isn't, isn't fishing? I think that's a good question. You know? Jesus, not Michael, but Jesus said, follow me and what? I'll make you become fishers of men. Are you a fisher of men? Number one, the persons that he called and understand that God can use you. Number two, see the purpose to which he called them and, and understand that his purpose must be your purpose if you're to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And then number three, Let's see the promise that he gave and understand that that promise is just as real to you today as it was when he gave, gave it to the disciples back then. What's the promise? Again, come after me and I, the Lord of glory, 
the sovereign Savior, I will make you to become fishers of men. That's the promise. That, that doesn't mean you're going to become a fisher of men overnight. Doesn't mean that ipso facto tomorrow morning you wake up a full-blown fisherman. Uh, you have to learn how to fish. And you have to, to have someone help you, teach you, someone to guide you. But, but if you'll submit yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ, to His church, then He'll make you to become. It's that process. And, and you must start that process somewhere and, and let the Lord begin to teach you. Let me give you an example of, of what He can do. We're in the Gospel of Mark, and, and just turn a little bit to the left there and, and turn to Luke chapter 5 for, for a moment. Here's a wonderful story, and we'll see there in just a second. But I was thinking about this the other day. You know, I've, I've gone fishing on several occasions where I didn't catch any fish. Anybody identify with me? <coughs> gone fishing, didn't catch one. Uh, one man said to his wife one time, what do you call it chopping? You know, the, the woman was going out window shopping, and he said, what do you call it shopping? You, you never buy anything. To me, he really doesn't have anything to complain about, does he? <laughs> She said, why do you call it fishing? You never catch anything. You know? Lots of times didn't catch a, catch a thing. But when I read where Jesus here is going to pay his taxes, and he told his disciples, Matthew 17, 27. We'll get to Luke in a minute. However, so that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw in a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you'll find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and me, right? You know, there was a problem about taxes and they're asking, why don't you pay the tax? And, and so Jesus says, well, go catch a fish and inside you'll find a shekel and pay the tax. I got to thinking about that. Jesus told them exactly what to do, but he must have not only told them what to do in terms of throwing out the hook and everything, he also had to tell that fish what, what to do too, didn't he? Go swallow that shekel that's down there. You know, come up and let him catch you. You know, isn't it wonderful that, that our Lord works on both ends of the pole? Both ends of the fishing pole? I think that that's wonderful that Jesus was working in, in both, both arenas. He's the master fisherman. And, and Jesus told them exactly how to do, them, do that. He, he told them how to fish and he guided the fish. And, and, and you, you also have the same idea right here in Luke 5, beginning at verse 1. It says, Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, and the fishermen had, had gotten out of them and were cast, were washing their nets, rather, washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little way from the land, and he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. So the people were so close that he needed to give out away from the land so that he could make kind of an amphitheater type thing and, and, and he could preach. And so he got out in this little boat, sat down and began teaching. And, and he, after he'd done this, notice what happened there in, in verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now this is the same Simon that we're talking about over here in Mark. Uh, he says, put, it, put the boat out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. But I will do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And, and they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. Wouldn't you like the Lord to do something in, in Temple Baptist Church that would astonish you like that? They were astonished. And remember, these were professional fishermen, alright? They were blown away by this. Verse 10. And so also were James and John, son of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon and Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on you will be what? 
hatching men. It's obvious that Jesus performed this miracle to teach them a lesson about fishing for men. He, he wasn't just interested in a lot of smelly fish, you know. But he says, do not fear because from now on you're going to be catching men. Look, look here at what he did. I, I want you to see the promise of God and understand that he can do that through you. We see four steps here. Let's look for them. Number one, in verse four, he told them to launch out <laughs> into the deep. That's where a lot of us are going to fail. We're never going to launch out. We're, we're never going to get started. And, and we're going to sit here today and we're going to take notes and we're going to listen and we're going to say amen. And we're going to nod our heads and we may even shed a tear or two, but we're going to have to launch out if we're going to catch any fish. You're going to have to say, by the grace of God, I'm going to get in the boat and, and get that boat off from the shore and I'm going to launch out by faith and out into the deep. I would dare say that very few people have ever caught a fish by accident. Amen? Anybody ever caught one by accident? Okay, one person, a whole group. That doesn't, doesn't often happen. Very few, if any, ever catch a fish by accident. You have to go fishing. You have to make up your mind that you're going to launch out. And, and the truth is that most of us would rather be keepers of the aquarium rather than fishers of men. Amen? You know? We, we're, we're glad to come here in our beautiful aquarium and, and say, you know, I'll do whatever God wants me to do here. You know? Uh, but we've got to launch out. Every Christian is to be a missionary, if, if only to the super, supermarket. Amen? Launch out. Well, you, you could say with me, by the grace of God, I'm going to do it. Could you do that? By the grace of God, I'm going to do it. One, two, three. Ready? By the grace of God, I'm going to do it. Number two, depend on Jesus. Look here in verse 5 of this chapter, here in Luke 5. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. But I will do as you say and let down the net to you. If you have your own Bible, then in, in verse 5, there are two words I want you to underline. The first one is the word we. And the second one is nothing. Master, we worked hard. We worked hard all night. Caught nothing. Didn't Jesus say that without Him you can do nothing? It's not necessary that, you know, necessarily that they were lazy. You know? Some people have tried with all their might to save souls. But you didn't win any because you were working in the energy of the flesh. You were trying to do it on your own. You need to depend on Jesus to do something supernatural. And, and let, me, let me tell you what, what the bridge to, to success is. The difference between failure and success is, is that word in the King James. It's nevertheless. In, in my uh, version here, the New American Standard, it's but. King James says, nevertheless at thy word. And mine said, but I will do as you say. In other words, we're going to bring the master, uh, the maker of men, into this. We're going to God's dynamism. Bring his dynamism into this. Soul winning isn't going out and doing something for Jesus. Soul winning is Jesus doing something through you. And that's the reason Jesus said, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. There's a supernatural dimension of Christ in us. Churches today are using marketing techniques to bring people to their meetings, using fancy ads and brochures. And let me say there's nothing wrong with, with that per se. Uh, but in other words, I think too many churches are buying into the idea that if we're good enough salesmen, then we'll be able to fill our churches. Uh, I heard one preacher who, who said of using salesmanship, he said, anything I can talk you into, somebody else can talk you out of. You know, I want God to work through my life if someone's going to come to Christ and come to Him and to His church. I want what happens through our church to be the Lord Jesus Christ working through my life and through your life. So if we make up a brochure, Okay, fine and good, but let's pray. God, use this. Let's depend on Him to use it and, and not just depend on the slick uh, 
paper that it's written on. I want Christ to be in me working. And, and let me ask you here, do you pray before you go out to win souls? Uh, the person who goes without praying uh, is, is a fool. And the person who prays without going is a hypocrite. And the person who prays and goes is a soul winner. But I will do as you say and let down the nets, Peter said. Number one, launch out. Number two, depend on, on Jesus. Number three, let down the net. You got to let down the net. Uh, you know what the net is? Well, the net's the gospel. Uh, it's the gospel net. You've got to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here's the problem. We, we've heard some people say, and sometimes we ourselves have said, you know, I just want people to see my life. And when they see my life, that will lead them to be saved. And, and I hate to state the obvious here, but they're not saved by my life or by your life. They're saved by his death. Amen. Uh, that's the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll talk more about this in a second. Verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. You've got to share the good news of Jesus Christ and Him dying for our sins. Suppose you're a fisherman, you come back from a fishing trip, and, 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 uh, and you, you say, you know, I, I asked you, did you catch some fish? And you say, no, but I influence quite a few. You know, it's not just going out and living among people. Don't get me wrong. That it's, we, we should try to influence people. Uh, you've got to do that, but you've got to launch out. So what I'm saying this morning is this. You've got to let down the net. You've got to be able to tell the story of Jesus Christ. Tell the gospel. And you may say, well, I don't know how. And I would... Wonder how long have you been a believer and you still don't know how to share your faith. You know, as soon as you're saved is the time to learn how to share the gospel. So it's definitely time you learn it if you don't know by now. If you don't know how, then, then you know, don't use that as an excuse because you can learn how. Well, I'm going to give you something here at the end that's real simple. Uh, and, of course, there's lots of other ways. That, but it's not complicated, especially when you know that the Lord Jesus is working at both ends of the pole, as we talked a while ago. Okay, last thing. Don't be discouraged if you've tried and failed. Your success to just share your faith. The results you leave to the Lord Jesus Christ. They belong to Him. As long as you've shared your faith. Verse 5 again. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night, caught nothing. But I will do as you say and let down the net. A lot of toiling, a lot of work, a little taking. You know, just keep on and say, I will do as you say and I will continue to let down the net. And don't let past failure discourage you. You know, these men had toiled all night long and taken nothing. And then all of a sudden they've got so many fish and the nets are breaking and the boats are about to sink. And they had to ask people to come over and help them. Well, you say, yes, but that was Simon Peter. That was, you know... You know, look at all the fish that they caught. Look at look at all the fish that he caught on the day of Pentecost too. You know, you know, actually people. Uh, but let me also tell you, there was a, another man in this boat uh, in Luke. He, he's not even mentioned. His name is Andrew. Talked about him a little while ago. You know, Andrew didn't preach on the day of Pentecost when the three thousand fish, you know, three thousand men were caught. But let me tell you a little more about Andrew. Andrew was, as I said, that quiet. Kind of introverted kind of, of, of young man. Uh, he was that fellow who when they, they uh, fed the 5,000. Remember he's the one who went out and found the lad. And brought him to Jesus with, with the loaves and fishes that he had. He's the one in John 12 who Philip brought these Greek people to. Uh, who wanted to see Jesus. And you know he was kind of a personal assistant to Jesus. You know he was that one on one worker work out the details and then come and explain it to Jesus. And so in other words, here's the thing. We may not all be preachers, you know, people who proclaim to a big congregation every Sunday, uh, but we can all be preachers and preach to at least one person at a time. Amen? You know? Uh, that, that's the kind of, of, of man that he was. Uh, one-on-one -on -one worker. 
Maybe not, maybe we won't catch 3,000 fish at a time, but we can one-on-one -on -one, 3,000 times through our lives win, win individuals to the Lord. There was a, an old Scottish preacher. He was, he was about, to, about to have a broken heart. Had a deacon who came to him and, and rebuked him quite strongly. He said, you preached all year and just one has been saved. And that, just a little boy. Just one little boy. But let me tell you about that one little boy. That one little boy came to the preacher after the service and he said, Preacher, can I talk with you? Of course he said yes. And he said, Preacher, Pastor, do you think if I studied real hard that God could use me and make a minister out of me? The minister, that, that old Scottish preacher, he said, Yes, Robert, he will. I know he will. Little Robert Moffat studied hard. And he became one of the mightiest missionaries that the world has ever known. Robert Moffat went to Africa and rolled back the boundaries of geography and, and brought the gospel of Jesus over there to Africa and, and brought savage tribesmen under the sway of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He eventually, at, towards the end of his ministry, he, he came to England to speak. And, and there he was speaking and sitting out in the audience was a young medical student. And Robert Moffat said, with tears in his eyes, he said, I've lifted up my eyes and looked to the vast plains and I've seen on the horizon the smoke of villages, thousands of villages where the gospel of Jesus Christ has never been heard. Won't somebody go? At the close of that service, another young man came and he said that to Robert Moffat, who now he was the veteran missionary there in Africa. He says to this veteran missionary, could God use me in Africa? And Moffat said to David Livingstone, yes, God could use you. And so Dr. David Livingstone, perhaps the greatest missionary in the modern era, went and changed Africa for Jesus Christ. One preacher, one little boy, just a little boy. Let me say this before we close. If you can't win that one man then win this one woman. If you can't win an adult, then win the little child. If you can't win somebody in your own family, then win someone in someone else's family. And if you can't catch a net full of fish, then catch one fish at a time. You don't know what God may do, but I'm telling you this morning that Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. All right, what's the gospel? Well, we all know the gospel in a nutshell. Repeat after me, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal, everlasting life. Y'all know that. There's where to begin. And then, we mentioned it a while ago. Get your, get your handy dandy Bible. Anybody got a Bible in your phone? If you don't have a Bible in your phone, you can get little ones that you can carry around in your pocket. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. You know, I don't believe in tattoos, but if I was going to tattoo something on my arm, I might tattoo 1 Corinthians 15. Because it's the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you, which also ye have received. And this is King James. Wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And then he goes on and talks about those who saw him risen and how the writer, Paul here, saw him. Just begin a conversation about that to share with people how to be saved. First Corinthians 15, read it in a more modern translation. That's the way to share your faith. Real simple. Recite you know, or, or go to John 3.16. Read that with the first person. Go to John, or 1 Corinthians 15. Share those first few verses there. 
And then ask the person, would you like to pray and ask Jesus into your life? All right? That begins their discipleship. You're, you're, they're ask, you're asking them to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus and then invite them to church and, and, and to learn more about God's Word. You know? Becoming a Christian is just deciding, I'm going to follow Jesus. And it's our job to invite people to do that. Amen? Let's commit to that today. If you need to make a decision for the Lord, uh, we're going to be singing a song. You come forward. If you need to join the church or whatever you need to do, let's all of us uh, respond to the Lord this morning as we stand together and sing.